really great talk. Now we are going to have a really interesting uh, panel. I think that is uh, good if you don't 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 walk away, just stay in the stage, you know. And uh, I think that this is a really interesting topic because uh, if you, if we are going to scale Bitcoin and to have a lot of many users than we have today, it is important to see how we plan to do that. So the panel is named Sidechains and Layers, what's the right way to extend Bitcoin functionality? We are going to have a really great panel of Bitcoin all-stars. So I do recommend you guys to stay here and enjoy this panel. Also, I recommend you to go to El Sonte tomorrow. We are going to be in Bitcoin Beach. I think that all of you have to be there. I've been plenty of times, but each time I'm, I am joined being where all of this started. So I'm going to introduce you the Bitcoin that, that is from Bitcoin that post, and he will be hosting this amazing panel. So Bitcoin that, if you are ready, let's go. Hey everybody, thanks for showing up. I'm the Bitcoin Dad from the Bitcoin Dad Pod, and I am on stage with three Bitcoin legends. I know I shouldn't need to introduce them, but you know, it's fun. So we have Peter Todd of Open Timestamps, Single Use Seals, known as a Bitcoin outsider, a critique, a contrary thinker. This is going to be interesting. And actually, single-use seals leads to Giacomo, because Giacomo Zucco, in addition to being a famously toxic maximalist memer, also has worked on Bitcoin scaling and is involved with RGB, which used single-use seals courtesy of Peter. And then we have another Bitcoin alternative view, John. John Carvalho of Synonym, whose work on slash tags and hypercores takes Bitcoin primitives and adds new features. Very interesting. And with that introduction, I would like to ask an open question to all of you. Imagine if tonight Barack goes to his hotel room and breaks the Lightning Network forever. What is your scaling solution now? Anyone jump in? It's a good question. Um, I can't resist from saying that we can always lean on zero cough for a while. Um, you know, w the, the, the purpose of Lightning is to give us both an instant ability to spend Bitcoin, but also high frequency. I don't know that we have a, a clear solution to replace the high frequency aspect, um, but certainly if people, you know, manage their risks, they could lean on chain uh, and, and, you, and accept zero conf if they do it responsibly for a while. Um, I, I don't know about, I don't know of any other scaling layers that exist um, because I don't think that, like for example, I think this panel is about side chains. I don't think that's a way of scaling uh, a network. But you can't add a blockchain to scale a blockchain. So I think we would be screwed. I mean, let's be clear. Unconfirmed transaction acceptance is not about scaling. It's about whether or not you can go accept a transaction as cash after it's sent. Now, if you're going to go and wave a magic wand and say lightning's broken, I'll go and uh, be the annoying person who says, all right, exactly how is it broken? Because can I just go use, uh, for instance, payment channels? You know, because there are many different types of payment channels out there. If you hypothetically say that lightning is broken, I can also go say, well, hang on. Well, why don't we have some federated payment channels where you know, you have some central entity, say, where we go and do our payments through, but you don't have the full routing that Lightning enabled. And there's many nuances to how this can go work. And, of course, you know, just going putting all our stuff in a bank could work just fine. I mean, I uh, heard there was a really good one, uh, FTX or something. Ouch. I think there is a, a, a correct answer and a honest answer, and they are different. Like, the correct answer, culturally speaking, is uh, we will scale with... Uh, current Lightning Network, future Lightning Network uh, uh, alternatives like uh, L2, or maybe uh, like federations and, and partial hybrids. The, the honest answer is that if we had to scale tonight, custodianship will not be avoidable. And custodianship in, in theory is not a 
capital scene itself. Like when there was no alternative, when there was only Bitcoin on chain or nothing else, Halfini was proposing Bitcoin banks, anonymous competing unregulated Bitcoin banks as the scaling solution to Bitcoin. It's not ideal because when you have competition, you will also have reputation and trust. Reputation and trust don't scale. And so you end up with a very few uh, with, with an oligopoly, which is easy to regulate, easy to censor, and easy also to uh, screw up from the inside, like, uh, like with the mistakes and stuff. So it was not ideal. But if there is no alternative, for sure the blockchain cannot scale to millions of users. That's technologically impossible. So I think that in the future, scaling will be layered with progressively more trustless solutions. If we had to scale tonight, the sad truth is that custodianship would be the only way. But that's not to say that we have to normalize custodianship. We should, I mean, there is a reason we say, uh, like, uh, keep your own keys. Even if it's hard, even if it cannot scale for everybody, as long as you can, you should, always. Sorry, but John just said you can't scale a blockchain with a blockchain. John, it sounds like you don't think side chains are a viable scaling option. What about you, uh, Peter and Giacomo? Do you agree with that statement? I agree for sure. I think that's inherently unscalable. Of course, the Bitcoin time chain, uh, your definition of a blockchain is a little bit. The blockchain is a chain of blocks. Come on. Gets is basically a blockchain. Well, th so in the end, like, there's a definition to scaling, and while I'm not expert in this area, I did look it up and, and have some grasp of how it works, and the concept is basically when you add resources to a network in order to give it more capacity in some sense, more users, more throughput, whatever, and so you, you need some form of scaling that network. And so any proposal that requires an additional network, the scaling becomes questionable at the very least, but with Lightning, at least, it's made out of Bitcoin transactions, right? So, you, so it feels pretty, like, pretty good as a scaling solution, at least for uh, quantity of transactions. Um, but to have a side chain or another blockchain call it scaling, well, then how do you say that it's, how can it be scaling and competing at the same time? It doesn't make sense. So I, I'd say it's quite simple. You know, and I'll give Liquid as an example. Liquid while Liquid itself is exactly as unscalable as Bitcoin, the combination of Liquid and you know, 10 other different things like Liquid, they scale Bitcoin by giving people different trade-offs to self-custodianship and trust. In much the same way is that even something like FTX scaled Bitcoin for the sort of people who are willing to go lose all their money. And, you know, I mean, these are trade-offs. Like, for certain people, you know, Tether on FTX is not a crazy way to go move money around. You know, they would be in and out fast enough, the risk is low enough, even though, of course, FTX has blown up. Let me correct my statement. Blockchains can scale or not, depending on the definition. Global consensus cannot scale. A system where everybody needs to register and verify every other transaction forever, which is Bitcoin, can scale. I cannot see that possibly scaling in any way. Uh, other systems can help this system to scale with very different trade-offs, of course. Well, I think these should come back to semantics again. You need to use words how you know they're meant to. And so, if you suggest custodianship or an alternative blockchain or alternative network that isn't using Bitcoin transactions, then it's not actually Bitcoin, right? So it's it's an IOU or a credit or something. And so at that point, you haven't scaled Bitcoin; you've converted it, right? And so if you consider conversion or custody as a form of scaling, you're just using a non-standard definition of scaling, really. Yeah, uh, the problem is that we have polysemantics. We have one word, Bitcoin, we use for several things. The, the protocol itself with the time chain and the settlement layer and the asset. The asset is a fraction of a difficulty adjusted proof of work following some parameters that you can transfer. That kind of asset itself with its scarcity property could be tomorrow maybe transferred to another system completely different. Uh, but the, bit, the Bitcoin anti-double spending solution as per to, to under, uh, to 2008 paper, that cannot scale significantly. I mean, if, you do, if you're strict enough with your definitions, Lightning isn't scalable the solution for Bitcoin either because it creates this whole new set of paradigms where suddenly, you know, I got to go check the chain every couple of days to make sure my counterparty hasn't tried to defraud me. You know, that's not, that's not the guarantees that Bitcoin itself provides. It's just the guarantees Bitcoin itself provides and the way Bitcoin does it 
can only be provided to a relatively small number of people. And if you think of Liquid as a Bitcoin custody solution, then do something like drive chains where there's a more distributed security model that doesn't rely on custody, does that actually fall as a scaling solution because it's non-custodial and it involves Bitcoin? I well, would say it's custodial. Yeah. It's just that the, the, the federation is a dynamic federation open, which can be better or worse depending on the situation. Uh, drive chain is basically an escrow where you say the majority of, of hashing power can take this money whenever they want. And, uh, and this is custodianship. The party which is doing the, 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 the custody, it's a dynamic pseudo-anonymous party, which could be better in some, in some senses, like against censorship, or worse in others, because for example, it's, easy, it's harder to fight uh, collusion if you don't know if these mining pools or these ASIC producers are colluding, like with uh, Segwit2x. It's notable that, uh, you know, Blockstream, after all, they were the ones who first promoted proof-of-work sidechains. And if you actually look at their, you know, tech slash marketing materials from way back in the day, like what would it be 2014, 2015 or so? Probably 15 with yeah, the with, first yeah, paper on that. 2015, yeah. They were very clear about what the trust was, which was this was a new type of digital signature scheme where the, where the party authorizing it was uh, multi-membership based on hash power. I mean, I, th I think... Is, someone could correct me, but I think the term they used was something like, you know, multi, a new type of multi-membership group signature based on hash power. Dynamic, yeah, yeah. there was also yeah. dynamic there. Yeah, it was very, very clear that, look, we're taking the, you know, now you go trust miners. And I think that's a terrible idea. And I also would say that I think merge mine sidechains are very dangerous for Bitcoin because they screw with the dynamics of Bitcoin. But, you know, purely from the point of view of, you know, is this a scaling solution where you go change the trust? Yeah, technically. Of course, there's this minor, or maybe not so minor problem that in implementing them, you also change what Bitcoin is for everyone else. Yeah, I would agree with both Peter and Giacomo on this, that you know the original vision for sidechains and the reason why they became seen and got an impression of the community to be a scaling method was the promise was a one-to-one -one peg that was trustless. And Blockstream, in their efforts to realize this, could not. And so we didn't end up actually getting a one-to-one -one peg trustless sidechain capability. And now that I, nobody since has solved it. And so what you, we keep getting is more complex, more weird, more mutated versions of either blockchains like shitcoins, sidechains like Liquid, or now this mutation for the proposal and drive chains. In the end, we don't need a blockchain to scale a blockchain. You're gonna have these trust trade-offs and they're ultimately gonna result in some form of custody or censorship that you expose yourself to to realize them. It's also fun, the evolution of Liquid is a very, it's a very fun example because they started off as a proof of work based uh, sidechain. Then they realized the, peg, the two way peg solution based on miners was not, uh, not tr trustless. So they moved, for, they moved to uh, multi-sig for the peg out but once you move on multi-sig for the peg out, the reason to keep merge mining for the double spending prevention just vanishes because you're already trusting the federation for something more fundamental. So you move to that. And when you move to that like liquid, the reason to keep a complex blockchain-like structure, it's, uh, I mean, uh, blockchain people say it's mostly for interoperability with uh, Bitcoin code base. But in theory, uh, liquid is a more complex version of a Xiaomi Mint which, with more uh, inflation auditability. But, but a Chaumian, like a, a, Chaumian Mint, a Chaumian Federation is way more direct than Liquid with the same trust model with a little bit less auditability for, uh, for inflation. I, I mean, I, I'd say, like, you know, if I were running a bank and I, customers were trusting me with their money as a, you know, as a fiduciary, there's no way in hell I wouldn't have a blockchain under the hood to do auditing. Because, you know, you can't trust your own employees. Like, you know, you can't trust anyone individually. You have to have some kind of auditing structure to go and make sure that everyone's following the right rules and that the right things are happening at the right time. And the best way we have right now to do that is some kind of blockchain in the a blockchain is a chain of blocks definition. So a git, uh, like a uh, com chained commitment, digital signatures and commitments basically. Yeah. Not necessarily a Bitcoin core like structure. Yeah. And, and frankly, the only reason why Liquid happens to use a blockchain whose cryptographic structure is nearly identical to Bitcoin is it meant they didn't have to write more source code. 
Exactly, interoperability. That's not to say that a trustless sidechain is impossible in theory. Like there is an old idea by Gregory Marx in 2013, uh, coin witness, in which uh, you have a compact zero knowledge proof that proves all the sidechain history on chain with, a, with an opcode that will do that. This in theory is possible and with current technology seems like inefficient but feasible. And this is a it different- has censorship problems. There are, and, and different security models, of course. So it's not the same, but some level of trustlessness into pegout is, is not impossible. Or another idea, if we get an alternative uh, structure, alternative to the Bitcoin blockchain, which is 100 times better, we can have just a space chain, a burn chain, so we can just migrate with a one-way peg. We burn Bitcoin, we go there, and eventually everybody stops using, well, if, if something is better, we just keep the UTXO set, we migrate, like we have a quantum no-clone theory uh, system, we migrate there. Yeah, I'll, so to be interesting, I'll say that gets to one thing I thought about with side chains or burn chains. Um, I, the, the only thing I can think about as like a practical use case is these might actually be a good way to hard fork. And, and if the research into these side chains or methods of you know, actually making a commitment to transfer the value, um, if there's research in the context of can we use this as a mechanism for activating a hard fork, maybe there's something there. But I don't have a lot of interest in it's not advancing scaling. hard right. forks. This is not know? scaling. This is, there is something better. We want to change Bitcoin. It's maybe better to migrate with a fork chain that, that are forking the code. Yeah. Well, th there is one hilarious example of this actually out in the wild, which is Dogecoin is merged mined with uh, Litecoin. And if I'm not mistaken, currently the Dogecoin market cap is bigger than the so-called parent chain, which who knows what I'll do to the economics in the long run. But uh, Elon Musk uh, may have things to say about that. Okay, well, that was an excellent takedown of side chains as the as the one of the three liquid users I feel a little disappointed but um, let's get on to layered scaling uh, Giacomo maybe you could describe RGB as a potential layered scaling solution and then John and Peter can uh, crap all over your ideas well, chronologically it started off from Peter so maybe uh, he, he, could, he could talk a little bit, a little bit about the idea of client side validation and I maybe could add exactly why we use that idea for RGB in the way it is now, if, if you want, because it's chronologically more correct. Yeah, so the idea of client-side validation is that, in, 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 I should, in fact, I'll start with a thought experiment. In Bitcoin, do we actually need the constraints that blocks have to be valid? And I would answer, no, they don't. It's quite possible to go have a Bitcoin system where the only constraint you have is that the proof of work is valid and that whatever is under that block actually matches some, some arbitrary piece of data up to say, you know, a megabyte in size. And that could be the only rule you have. And then all the other rules can be done by layering on top of that saying, well, if you want to go receive money on the system, you simply go run this second set of rules from the Genesis block to the beginning that parses that data and figures out, well, what among all that data is a valid transaction? And the parts that are valid transactions, you just ignore. And the parts that are valid transactions, you treat as money. And that turns out to be maybe not so useful on Bitcoin, although I, I'd, I'd have an argument about that. But certainly on things where you want to create systems using Bitcoin's consensus to say, you know, trade NFTs or trade, you know, tether assets or something, you can do all of the logic of what is or isn't a valid transaction client side and then link back to something like Bitcoin for only the double spend prevention. And the neat thing about this is if you go and sort of boil this down something called single use seal where you say, all right, I have this thing which can be closed over some data and that's the thing that prevents the double spend. Long story short, if you throw a bunch of Merkle trees at the problem, you can make the scale really, really well with the trade-off, at least in the na naive way of doing it, where now someone can go and censor you. They can't go fake anything because all this data is being checked client-side, but they can go censor you and prevent you from spending your money. And if you throw enough Merkle trees at a problem, I mean, you could get, you know, four billion transactions per second with 32-bit deep, uh, you know, Merkle tree. I mean, scaling this stuff's really easy. It's just a very different model than, say, how Bitcoin works, but that is, some of the stuff that you know, RGB is working on. Of course, can you 
move bitcoins themselves this way, not really without the def you know without changing what a bitcoin is. My role in that, so the, the migration from that idea to RGB is basically, so th this idea provides a lot of advantages. Scale, privacy, s mining censorship resistance, because the miners don't even know what they are confirming. But uh, there are trade-offs. One is uh, you have to be online to receive, because you have to receive the off-chain proofs, and you have to back up all the proofs separately from your uh, uh, seed phrases. So harder to back up, harder to receive. And so I was thinking that uh, Lightning already has the same two trade-offs, mostly. You have to back up states. It's even worse because it's toxic waste, which is not true for RGB. And you have to be online to receive. Actually, even worse, you have to be alive, uh, online continuously to, to keep uh, your channel safe. So if we can pull off Lightning Network, we can add client side validation on top. And that's the idea of RGB. Interestingly, RGB right now is promoted for uh, collectibles or taters or centralized stuff. And it's just because we want to experiment with something. But eventually, if we find a good two-way peg system, RGB, RGBTC could be a great sidechain candidate. But we need a, a, to, a, a peg out system, of course, and we don't have it. I mean, I, I'll just point out, I had a kind of sort of half-baked idea called tree chains many, many years ago where using this kind of client-side te technology, there may be a way to go and split up the mining of Bitcoin to apply these same techniques with, of course, yet more Merkle trees to essentially split up the consensus so that you could scale Bitcoin on-chain transactions directly. And, you know, maybe the intuition I'll just give you is if I'm giving, you, you know, Alice money and I'm giving Bob money, if the money doesn't come from the same place, they don't need to verify each other's transactions. That's, that's why this type of thing can scale. I, I don't have a lot to say as to whether I think RGB could scale or it will scale Bitcoin so much as, you know, as Giacomo mentioned, right now it's being talked about in the concept co co context of tokens. Um, we hear it talked about in the con uh, context of identity, of storage, of scaling now. I would just say, I just like what would like to see some focus on the scope so you can have a forward moving progress, you know, so we can see what, what we can actually use this for practically. Um, there's theoretically, I guess anything is possible if we can rationalize it, but in there the was end, a, we need to ship it, you know. I'm very happy that in Lugano, me and Peter could exchange shit coins for the first time on RGB because Federico Teng and the Bitfinex team created a small practical iris wallet. So yeah. finally there is an example. But so far, don't get excited, it's still iris about shit wallet. Coins. <laughs> but it's still about shit coins, so we are still far away from using RGB for something significant. Wow, that was really good. So. Um, can you think of a final soft fork? Is there in your mind a technology, perhaps theoretical at the moment, that is the final uh, soft fork on the Bitcoin main chain that enables all the scaling, all the stuff you want, preserves the decentralization and uh, censorship resistance of the current network, go. Well, Adam Beck will answer a simplicity language, which could be used to compose everything in theory, but not to get repeat repetitive, but a client-side validation model would allow for local e evolution of any kind of script flexibility without touching the global consensus. So maybe that's very, very far away, but a very good client-side validated model would allow a lot of extensibility, maybe a final level of extensibility. And, and this is data hidden in the taproot script or in the... Well, not not necessarily. Yeah, any kind. So there is the, the only thing that the time chain does is anti-double spending check. Everything else is between me and you or, and the other guy that will receive later. So we can uh, upgrade indefinitely. There is no, so in, in client side validation, there is no soft fork. There's just different people using different uh, protocols among it, each other. It, it's important to recognize like in a client side validation model, much like, I mean, similar how Lightning works, it's okay if, you know, Giacomo and I go use a completely different client side validation model than, you know, Alice and Bob. Like, they can do their thing, we can do their thing. We do not have to interoperate. You know, it really doesn't matter, and for that matter, you know, they won't even see each other's data because so much of it's off the chain anyway. You know, much the same way that if Jack and I, again, are using a slightly different version of Lightning or a very majorly different version of Lightning than Alice and Bob, I mean, it really doesn't matter. Certainly, in that case, 
the bitcoins will be the same and you could always send on chain but how exactly these different parties go and move money around with something like lightning or something like you know an rgb like protocol it really doesn't matter in fact to answer your question maybe i'll say all right you know my my deep down wish is not for that final soft fork it's for that final hard fork where we just remove all the consensus rules and do everything client side <laughs> So just to... I, I'll just say, I, I want to come at it from a different angle and say I think that the final soft fork should be Taproot. Um, I, I, would, I would like to see the design constraint of keeping Bitcoin the way it is without adding more complexity and seeing what we can build without adding, continually adding features and surface to Bitcoin. Um, because so far, I, I don't think we've really done a good job proving the, the necessity of, of this kind of thing. And there now is a culture of people wanting many more soft forks. And I think it becomes unmanageable at some point. And users don't really have a good way to interface with whether these things are safe, et cetera. So I would say, you know, the, the best last final soft fork is Taproot. So have we been discussing layered scaling? Is the smart way to say layered scaling client-side validation? No, I, I wouldn't necessarily say so. It, it, it depends on what type you're talking about. You know, one type of layer scaling happens to use client-side validation. That particular type, it finds it very hard to interact with Bitcoin directly. You know, I mean, let's be clear. Like right now, RGB cannot make Bitcoin move. It can make NFTs move. It can make, you know, things representing Tether move, but it cannot directly make BTC move. So layerization is a very general concept. You have it in architecture as well. You have the real estate, which is fixed, and then you have the foundations and the main uh, walls, and then you have the additional walls that are, not, uh, that are not structural. Then you have the furniture. So layerization is a good rule in general for any kind of construction. And what it means is that some things must be uh, like uh, must be s stable first uh, and uh, and they are the base and some things on top can be more fastly uh, evolved they can you can have more competition and more evolution while at the lower level you need convergence and stability so as a general concept uh, a lot of things are layers on top of Bitcoin. So even if the current Lightning Network will disappear, I think we will still have a lot of layers on top of Lightning Network, meaning that we need other kind of meta structure that we can play with, breaking things and moving faster, breaking more things and moving slightly faster than on the main chain, which will just become reliable, like a gen generational wealth transfer level of stability, which requires, as, as John said, M m stability over flexibility. Yeah, I would say if, if we're going to respect the stricter definition of scaling that you, know, you are increasing the capacity of Bitcoin, um, then right now I think the lay, uh, Lightning is like the only arguable scaling layer that we have. Um, I think maybe it could be possible. I, I'm not smart enough to design it, but you know, Lightning optimizes for transaction frequency and speed. Maybe there are other qualities of transacting that can be optimized in new types of layers, like size of transaction or priority or uh, fee. You know, all, there are many qualities to a transaction. Maybe we can do other types of layers that optimize for those and specialize. Um, I, I don't know if we'll see that, but I would. I think that you have to respect the definition, and unfortunately, the, the, the true form of scaling is by changing the magic numbers of Bitcoin, which is always extremely controversial, like changing block size, quantity of Bitcoins, etc. cetera. Um, but that is always a last resort that we can turn to. That's really interesting, because it sounds like this debate has been pretty heterodox in that custody, reducing, um, the ability to transact without an external party has been discussed as a potential way to sort of dirtily scale. But in terms of a layered approach, is there some sort of fundamental limit to layered scaling? Is it constrained by physics or, or some theoretical limit? It's constrained right now in, in some types of layer scaling by the simple fact that things like Lightning need at least one UTXO per user. Of course, when I say constraint right now, I mean there was, a, I, I wish I remember who, who gave the talk, but you know, I watched a talk right, right here, what, three hours ago on how potentially you could go and use new opcodes to go and share one UTXO again among many, many different Lightning users with, Merk, you know, with more Merkle trees as a 
usually tends to be the answer. Well, you know, and how much that scales and how feasible that is, well, we'll see. State chains are partially partially trusted because you need an external signer for double spending, but you are sharing the UTXO. You are reselling a, a, a around the UTXO. So th th you can do a lot of things. Of course, you have the limits of physics. So uh, as far as we know, uh, the speed of light, I mean, uh, outside the head of Vitaly Buterin, physics matters. And uh, there is like uh, NP is probably not P and speed of light and quantum of action. So you have some limits. But other than that, there is a lot of space to play. Bitcoin does break down when Bitcoin miners start going off into space and the speed of light goes and causes the latency to get too high. And certainly within the, you know, 10 minute space lights time whatever bubble, there's only so much matter that can be turned into computers. So. You, you think this is theoretical, but Peter made a presentation which is almost a BAP about that in uh, Breaking Bitcoin Paris. Uh, so, so solar powered uh, space uh, pirates. Well, was, uh, yeah, solar powered space miners. But even there, Bitcoin. even there you just you sort fork Bitcoin to have one blocks every three days and you probably have a good latency. So we can, we can fix that. I guess the most abstract limit of the w or expressing limit of scaling would just be that they're all trade-offs. And so if you redesign something without all of the assumptions of Bitcoin, you're now replacing some of those assumptions with something else. So that's, that's always going to be a core limitation is you have this dynamic that you're changing and you're making a trade-off. It was interesting that in this uh, Bitcoin cycle, the fee pressure didn't echo the 2017 um, uh, chain congestion, or maybe not to such an extreme degree. Does that suggest that the combination of scaling technologies on Bitcoin has already in many ways met the Bitcoin main chain demand? And is fee congestion and high fee pressure an important part of the scaling process that sort of moves development and thought in that direction? I suspect that, so there's this idea that, you know, in the future when miners will only have fees to go earn money, there will be huge backlogs of transactions and, you know, some transactions will take days to confirm and so on and so forth. And that tends to be the rosy statements people go give for, well, how will we pay for mining in the future? And there's various technical reasons too why it's very important in these, you know, in this future to go have backlogs. But I suspect there isn't that much use for Bitcoin where people can go wait, you know, potentially many, many hours or a few days to get their transaction confirmed. Like, I, I suspect that, that that part of the, you know, the supply demand curve is actually very, very narrow. You know, it's things more like Binance having the demand to go and move their wallet from, you know, a whole bunch of one addresses to a small number of another addresses. They seem to have that use case for Bitcoin every six months, especially whenever they might need to go clog things up a little. But uh, let's, let's be nice to them here. But how many users are really in that position? I suspect not very many. And that may be why, while there was a bunch of fee demand early on, that seemed to evaporate for a long time. And part of that might just be, well, you know, Lightning did, did take a lot of transactions away from the chain and reduce that demand. But, you know, it's hard to say. Of course, we get weirdness like Moon, which under the hood isn't actually a Lightning wallet. It does one, you know, on-chain transaction for every non-trivial amount you send. So, you know, how does that play into it? We're not really sure. Yeah, I'm skeptical that, uh, that Lightning had much to do with the change uh, toward 2017 for the reason that uh, the spike that you're talking about is about people depositing and withdrawing from exchanges. And exchanges are integrated with Lightning, but let's be honest, it's like uh, uh, Lightning traffic on exchanges is not that important. To be clear, the, the spike we're seeing at this very moment, it's almost certainly, at least super majority of the transactions it's just Binance going and consolidating all their old GTXOs. I mean, it really is, you know, like something like 15 Bitcoin worth of fees from one party with many, 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 you know, thousands and thousands of UTXOs they want to go and move from one place to another. So, you know, I'm sure on top of that, we get some interest in people moving their money, but like it seems that most of the reason why the fees suddenly went up was purely Binance. And interestingly, Binance could have paid a lot less but they picked a certain fee target, and since they picked that fee target and dumped, you know, 400 megs worth of transactions, uh, well, all right, less than that actually, but, you know, a couple hundred megs worth of transactions onto the mempool at once, 
then your minimum fee to get mined suddenly jumps up to that, even though they're kind of bidding against themselves. I think it's safe, sorry, John, it's safe to say that this level of uh, on-chain block space demand is the physiological one for this state of adoption, which is very, very low. People are just using centralized, ex centralized exchanges to gamble and nothing else. I mean, Bitcoin is very, very early yet. And what we've seen in the previous cycle was the anomaly probably driven by Bitmain, shenanigans and, and stuff like that, spam attacks. So I think that long term, Bitcoin will, we will, Bitcoin will need lightning and stuff like that to scale because global consensus cannot. But for this level of adoption, probably nobody cares for four megabyte blocks yet. So, uh, well, seg SegWit discount was probably a bigger factor than lightning. Like we gave a four X discount for, for, for block space. So maybe that's more important than lightning so far. Yeah, I think there are like three practical factors to answer your question and then some theoretical stuff we could talk about. But the three practical things are, yes, we, we got Lightning Network, so at least some amount of transactions were offloaded. Um, we could question how significant that really is, but some. Um, when we did raise the block size with the SegWit discount, and so that increased the impact, the, it made it more difficult to fill the blocks. Because um, technically, they've all, if we had, think of it as the one megabyte blocks we had, well, they've been full pretty consistently since 2017. Well, I mean, that, that was what I was trying to get at with my point about, you know, demand. I mean, blocks have been nearly full constantly. And I suspect that's just because there isn't demand for the, you know, the reason why you get that but not to backlog is I think comes down to there just isn't demand for doing transactions or doing things with Bitcoin that'll take a very long time to confirm. On the other hand, there's plenty of demand for doing things that'll confirm in the next block. I'm gonna quote you on that. <laughs> um, and then the third factor is Bitcoin has had growing competition for payments use cases. You can talk about Tether, you can talk about shitcoins, but these things, you know, if you, if you look at statistics from like major merchants like BitRefill, they have seen a growth in use of percentage of their payments coming from alternatives. And so some of the, the, the capacity might be offloading to other networks as well. Um, and then to, to kind of complement some of what Peter was saying earlier, like when we had truly full blocks, we didn't have very high tolerance for it for very long. Um, thus, you know, the use case people wanted faster and cheaper. Um, and we pretty quickly rose, you know, added block size, we added block capacity. I theorize that our tolerance for that, again, will be similar. You know, I think that if we fill the four megabytes and people are waiting forever for their transactions, there will probably be demand for bigger blocks again. Yeah, I, I, don't, I don't agree with you because I think that demand converts over to lightning and other things. I, I think the politics are not in the right place to, at least for the foreseeable future, ever get demand for raising the block size. I mean, it happens without much, like we didn't even demand it and it happened. Um, I, I kind of didn't even really quite realize it was happening when it was happening because I was newer then. But I think that, you know, it really depends on if people can get what they want out of Lightning in that condition. Like, if it becomes too expensive to open a channel and there's still a swath of Bitcoiners that want to transact, they will push for this, theoretically. Yeah, but we have many alternatives we didn't have in 2017 and we have already the historical example of a compromise that the wouldn't discount that turned out to be over compromising politically. So I think that the resist resistance would be huge yeah, at this time. I, I do feel like it kind of just got in and people weren't really asking for it, but it, it was like some sort of horse trade or something. Um, well, but yeah, there is a silver it did happen. Lining. Silver <laughs> lining. In the, that situation, Peter will stop complaining about low inflation. So th 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 that's a, that's the, a positive. The, uh, Kieran, the, the way the witness discount was set was pretty much, it was, like set to a number that was actually quite high based on the assumption that tons of people would use multisig. And of course, you know, I, I think like Binance's billion dollar address, I'm not even sure if it uses multisig. So, you know, that part didn't come true, but for technical reasons, it's hard to kind of set that discount any higher because there's just no way to use it for, you know, given how SegWit works. So that was a really interesting romp. We moved through layered scaling, client-side validation, older technologies like ZeroConf that offer some off-chain scalability. He's calling it a technology, which is already very flattering. <laughs> ZeroConf is <laughs> <and> scaling. <laughs>
We have one minute left. Would each of you like to mention a technology, an obscure thought that might relate to scaling that you'd like the community to be more aware of and perhaps research? Or is it, does it end with zero conf? Uh, oh, I, I mean, I think that, you know, if you're an enthusiast, you're researching already what you're interested in Bitcoin. And, you know, if you feel like you're missing out, then, you know, just add more people to who you follow and more resources. I, I don't have any specific thing I want to pitch so much as, you know, everybody, I think, is interested in the moment, or a lot of people here are interested in the moment in, in the zero conference IPF have debate, but it's not like a technology, it's not a scaling thing, it's just a, a quality that uh, we'd like to protect in the network, and, you know, I, I would like to see it last for as long as it may last without intervention, but it's not really something to promote as scaling or, right. or this kind of thing. If uh, John fails to make Tapro the ra last soft fork, it would be, I think it would be very interesting to look, in, look into cross-input uh, signature aggregation because it's another kind of discount in a way which is alternative and competitive with the, with the discount but it does uh, incentivize CoinJoin which is very important for privacy. Uh, so I think that uh, Chisa, it's, it's hard, nobody is really working on any BIP. And the other thing is uh, any prevout because, uh, or Sikash no input, any prevout, this kind of stuff, because L2 is a way to have easy multi-party channels. So Peter was talking before about sharing one UTXO, and L2 channel can be shared across uh, 10 people, 100 people, 1,000 people. They have to stay online, but they can share it, just like a state chain. You can do that with the current lighting channel, but the, but the punishment mechanism is very, very difficult to implement for 100 people. With an L2 system, there is no punishment, so there are some trade-offs, but you can actually have 100 people on the same channel, and that, I think, will change the scalability discussion a little bit. I mean, since L2 doesn't have punishment, you probably can't use it in a decentralized system, but L2 would be fine for something like Phoenix Wallet, where you don't seriously think Phoenix Wallet is going to go steal your money and get away with it. Being able to prove they stole your money is enough. And the Lightning Network can actually route across different kind of channel. We can have an L2 channel and uh, a, a, a Driapun channel and the Decker, uh, Decker uh, channel. We can have different construction and route across them. I'll just say, I have a lot of skepticism about multi-party channels, multi-party TXOs, because you're creating some weird games. And as you mentioned, it's hard to do the punishments and like, what do you do about collusion and whether these things actually play out as, as practical as is tricky? Well, I'll mention one scaling solution that hasn't yet, which is open timestamps. If you don't actually care about do double spend prevention, just use it. Please give a round of applause for our panelists. That was a fantastic conversation. And thank you very much for your perspective and your work on Bitcoin. Thanks. Thank you. Just